industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. So we are back for another Lusitania month video, but this is going to be one that's going to go into further detail this time because last week's video, we've talked about the captains of the Lusitania, but we're going to be re-looking at one of them because there's a whole new depth into his story and it's one that we've been waiting for a very long time to do, but we finally managed to do it. And it is the story of Captain William Turner. It and, is. and Jake has actually come on to talk about uh, Captain William Turner as well. Jake, oh, yeah. hello. <laughs> you Again. just got bumped in, we're like, yes, let's do this. Yes. <laughs> 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 oh dear but it's, it's really great to have you back on again jake really because i know you you cannot go away from me no not on this channel <laughs> <laughs> oh, but... for some reason people like hearing me talk so i don't know why but there you go <laughs> there you go it's just one of those great mysteries <laughs> i know but it's a perfect time to actually do this for Lusitania Month because I know for months we really wanted to do a video on Captain Turner, but we finally managed to do it, especially at this time. But I don't think we need any more introductions. So, Jake, I'm handing over everything to you. Thank you. I mean, I've got my notes down the side of me because, you know, again, my memory isn't what it used to be. So I'm working off notes. <laughs> Anyway, so Captain William Turner. I mean, everybody seems, everybody knows who Captain William Turner is. But what they probably don't know is his life before and after the sinking of the Lusitania, because we know that he was in command of her. Captain William Turner was born into a mariner's uh, family. Uh, his dad was a captain. He was born in uh, on, the, on October the 23rd. 1856 on Clarence Street, Everton, Liverpool. And uh, Captain William Turner was a very intrigued man when it, a uh, young boy, shall I say, not man, but young boy. And at the age of eight, um, he would go down to the docks at Liverpool and he would sit there waiting for ships to come in. And he would particularly he'd be sitting there waiting for his dad to arrive, his father, on his ships. Um, and he it really intrigued him. He, he really wanted to see the world. He really wanted to travel on ships and um, just learn the whole seafaring. So you can see that he got the, the bug from his dad. But his dad didn't want him to be a captain. He didn't want him to join the ships. His dad actually wanted him to actually become um, part of the church. He wanted him to have a religious life. He wanted him to become a minister in the church. So he wanted him not, you know, I think it's because um, his dad, uh, Charles Turner, uh, Captain Charles Turner, knew the life that he would probably have. And it's not an easy life, especially back then. Um you know, you'd be away from home uh, most of the time and the seas could be very unforgiving. And back when, you know, when his dad was a, a captain, he was sailing wooden sailing ships, which were known for foundering, for sinking in storms. So in those days, it was such a risky business. And I suppose, you know, he didn't want his, his son to become, uh, to put his life at risk and to, to be away, away from home so much. And and in some cases, some captains would never return because of, you know, of, of how unforgiving the oceans can be. So anyway, Captain, uh, sorry, William Turner, I wouldn't say captain because he wasn't quite captain then, but William Turner... Uh, would go down to the docks and he would also speak to sailors and and men that had been working on ships to get an idea of what it's like to be on on the ocean and to sort of because he would he was very interested in their stories and what they would tell him from their travels you know he was just a very intrigued young boy 
And um, in the end, he, he ended up leaving school very early. Now, it's early compared to the, today. Today, you would leave school at the age of 16. Uh, in the UK, we leave school at the age of 16, and then we go on to college. But in those days, early, for us, it's early because you would normally leave school between the age of 13 and 14, depending on your parents, okay? So you would have to ask your, permit, your parents' permission to leave school. And William Turner wanted to leave school. And he left school at the age of 14. And instead of going into the church, um, he went to sea. He would join his, uh, his first ship was the Grasmere, which was a small ship that only weighed around 432 tons. And she was built in 1847. And uh, William Turner had his first brush with disaster when he was on board this ship because she was caught in a gale and a storm uh, just off the coast of Northern, Northern Ireland near Belfast uh, in Antrim. And she struck the rocks and she sank. My um, God. I mean, compared to like the, those that you're going to explain later, Jake, uh, with the, yeah. the other ships that um, William Turner actually was involved with, first shipwreck, it it just explains it does it explains yeah. that the disasters that were about to occur exactly um but william turner had the ability to swim like a dolphin he, he i mean he was a very good swimmer so he, he managed to uh survive the disaster from the grass moon anyway uh so that was his first brush of, of disaster and so his father sort of gave in in a sense, and he, because of how, I think it kind of impressed him, but also the worry, of course, it's his son, you know, he's you know he's been in a disaster, it's gonna worry his, his father, but of, of course he's, his father knew how unforgiving the seas could be, so you can imagine why, this is the reason why he didn't want his son to, to be on ship, but his father did give him a command under it, under him, and he joined the his father's ship, the White Star. The White Star weighed 2,217 tons. And she was a sailing ship for the, uh, for the Marine Limited Trading Company. Oh, sorry, the Merchants Trading Company Limited, Liverpool, which, which is what his father his father worked for. That was that was the company that his dad worked for. And he, he joined as cabin boy. Under his, under his own father. Now, during his time uh, on the White Star, he had to learn 450 different types of ropes. And they, he had to learn every single function for each, you know, for each rope. You can imagine. It's and difficult. he had to learn it. And he had to learn it. So it was a very difficult life. But he he enjoyed it he enjoyed every minute of it and um you know and he really listened and and took on board what other sailors were doing uh he was a very quick learner again i think this is to do with his bloodline you know his family his it's obviously was in his blood the sea um so <laughs> So one of his one of his other jobs was also maintaining the ship. That was the same with any crew member, maintaining the ship, making that she's working fine, making sure the ropes are all. And he also had to learn how to tie ropes, and there was different ropes, different types of of how you would tie a ship, or tie a um, a, a mast or something, you know. And he and he had to learn all this, but that was his job. It you know he he had he had to learn how to, you know, to do all this. One of the things that really dreaded the crew on the, the White Star was that she would travel to the um, to, to Tropic Islands. And one of these islands uh, that, they, that she would travel to was it would have to pass the equator. And anyway, <laughs> the crew didn't like it. 
the crew didn't like it because one of the reasons why they didn't like it was they would end up re- going through the horse la- latitude, which had the um the nickname of doldrums. Now, the reason why is because when they pass the equator, there's no air, there's no wind. With a sailing ship, it's not like a, a ship that runs on, on you know, um, engines. This relies on, on wind. And when there's no wind, you're having to capture every wind that you can get to be able to move your ship. And you're not going to move a 420-something ton or 430 something ton ship on your own. It needs wind. But they did. They they got there. And um anyway, when the White Star had dot um in in uh, the the Tropic Islands, uh when they reached uh, an island called uh I've got it in my notes here somewhere, it was called the Gunrape Island, something like that. Gunrape, Gunrape. Uh, that's how I think that's how you pronounce it. He was Captain William Turner was uh, surprised to get a transfer uh, onto his um, father's other uh, ship that he would command was the uh, the Queen of Nations, um, which was another ship that his his dad was under command. So this was after he'd sailed on the the White Star. He, the the transfer was um was agreed uh with the merchant trading company that he would go over to the uh, queen of nations uh which was bound for uh from the um Gunape islands to uh, carlo uh, carlo to far, uh, then to liverpool so the next ship he was involved with uh was a full rigged uh a full rigger which was called the war spirit and the war spirit weighed around 1190 tons so these so ships were becoming big they were becoming big and heavier and but while he was on the the war spirit yellow fever broke out on the ship but lucky enough for william unlike other crew members on board that have died from that had died from the yellow fever lucky for william turner he never caught it he never caught yellow fever. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be talking about him and the Lusitania. He probably would have died. But lucky enough, he did not catch the 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 you know the disease. And then, when he returned to England after this incident, he had changed his uh, home port from Liverpool to London, and he had um he he started working on a ship called the Dungreg. Uh, Don Craig or something, yeah, which was a small ship that weighed around seven and seven hundred and forty tons. So she was a lot smaller. And uh, but on during his time uh, on this ship, he would learn navigation because his dream was to obtain his master certificate. He wanted to become master, um, and so he wanted to to learn everything. And what are the what are the things that he would um obviously uh take on board is um uh direction and and things like that and punct- he, he was very punctual with everything that he was doing uh on these ships and he wanted to make sure that he had everything behind him so that when he did sit his his exams he knew what he was doing and and he would pass them so around around um the late I'd say around 1870, something like that, he had got a job aboard the what the Royal Alfred, which was his very first ironed hull ship, which was which weighed around 1,239 tons under the command of Captain Fisher. And again, during his time on this ship, he would he would again have uh, the striving ability to try and learn navigation to then achieve his dream of becoming a master. But also, William Turner also learnt the fiddle. He he actually trained himself and taught himself to learn to play the fiddle. During his time on the Royal Alfred, um, he had achieved his third master certificate. And already he was also studying for his second command certification. 
and it didn't take him long to achieve it, neither. His next ship was the Thunderbolt, and which weighed 1,193 tons, which was bound from Col- Calcutta, and a major life threat, and, and also on board this ship, a life-threatening event happened again to William Turner. So after it survived, a, a, you know, a storm and the collision of the uh, Grasmere, and then surviving yellow fever, uh, you know, not catching yellow fever, he was thrown overboard while he was off duty, the bow of the ship, fishing. He was doing some fishing, and he was thrown from a co- by a comber overboard and lucky enough the crew knew they had been thrown overboard and they suddenly shouted man overboard problem is the ocean that he ended up being thrown into was shark infested and the sharks wanted they were very interested in him they wanted to eat him and but and, and they threw a life boy over to him so that he could get over you know get onto the life boy but during this time, they they had to turn the thunderbolt over, you know, round to get to William Turner. And by, while he was doing this, he was kicking and punching sharks to get away from him. And just as they were were rescuing him, this shark took a very very sharp interest in him, like the others. But this one was really going for him. He ended up having to uh, uppercut punch the shark just to stop him from getting eaten. I know. Like, wow. <laughs> this man, oh. this man is, wow, you know, you know, wow, yeah. <laughs> I I feel sorry for this guy, you know, considering what he's going to go through next. So, so, he'd put, so obviously he'd done this and he'd, he'd sucker punched his shark on the you know, so he could get rescued. Then he returned to Liverpool, and when he when he returned to Liverpool, he joined as the as a junior officer with the um with the Inman Line, uh, which he had briefly uh which he briefly served as third officer on their ship called the Egyptian on uh, on the Leyland Line, and he'd also joined. Oh, sorry. When when he was with the Inman Line, he joined as junior officer on the uh, City of Chester, and then. He had served two voyages on that ship. Then on the then he had served uh, on the Leyland Line um, uh, on the on the Egyptian. And then again during his time on the on the Egyptian, um, he was studying for his navigation again to again obtain his actual captain map. You know his actual captain um, master certificate. But he never lacked. This is what this is what. In, with, which fascinates me with Captain William Turner. This is how um, persistent and and um, ambitious he was. He never lacked in his studies. He, he was always studying and always watching his captains and how they behaved and how they would, you know, take command of their their. You know, he was always doing it and and, and always focusing on navigation so he could get through his exams, and then. In 1878, a 22-year-old um, William Turner was now serving as fourth officer. Um, and then in October, he he made a decision to shape the rest of his life and the rest of his career. And he joined, in October 1878, he joined the Cunard Line, which we know he had a very, very active uh, career. His first ship under the Cunard line was the Cherbourg uh, that he was appointed to, which she weighed around 1,614 tons. The Cherbourg would also bring him some attention because during a the uh, during a, on a on a on the morning of the debar- departure from Liverpool. Uh, the ship was steaming through some dense fog, some really, really dense fog. And the ship had dis- uh, had struck uh, another ship called the Alice Davis in the Hunk- Hunkinson's uh, Dock. 
But lucky, look, well, lucky for the shirt bulk, she didn't sink. But she was damaged, but she didn't sink. And they immediately halted the vessel. So the shirt, so the shirt bulk not only did collide with the Alice Davis, but also became the ship's rescue ship. And now Captain William Turner uh, well, decided to jump into the ocean and rescue a young boy that was that had clambered onto that had climbed onto the 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 sinking ship's uh, rigging and rescued him but unfortunately when the the um when the Alice Davis sank she she took with her the pilot and four crew members they drowned they were killed but that wasn't the only thing that um that he would do uh, because he would also end up rescuing another young boy that I'll go into uh, when I get to that. And uh, anyway, so he'd done that, and <laughs> Captain William Turner was... Ne the next heroic event that Captain William Turner would, um, would, would take part in was uh, one February night... Uh, sorry, one February morning. It was a really cold foggy morning and he was walking next to the Alexandra docks in Liverpool and he had noticed some crowds around the docks looking down into the water and it turned out that on the February of 1883 uh, that a young boy a 14 year old boy had fell into the frigid cold waters of the dock oh my god yeah and William Turner took it upon himself to take his shoes off, take his grey overcoat off, because he was heading towards his ship, you know, to, to to be, you know. And as he was on, as he was on the way, he noticed these crowds, and 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 I was, and this young boy had fallen in uh, to the dock, and he selflessly took his cap off, took his grey overcoat off, and his shoes and jumped into the frigid, frigid waters. So he put himself at risk to, to jump in again to rescue another young boy. And he remembers it, the, the cold being like the cold water. It was like a thousand knives stabbed, being driven into the body. It was that painful. So after he rescued this boy, he was awarded the... Um, the, the he was, had been awarded the Severe, severe Medal... So it was a silver medal, sorry, silver severe medal uh, for his selfless act. Realistically, I mean, I will go into when how people treated him after the Lusitania sinking, but this man, you know, he did some selfless acts. So it puts, realistically, it really puts him in a better light in a way after, you know, his... Um, rocky business with the Lusitania. But anyway, in 1883, the well, after this act, he had decided to um, leave the 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 Cunard line. And during this time, he was he was um, still sailing the oceans. But he what he wanted to do was he he really wanted to get his master's certificate. So. By doing this, he had to leave the Cunard line in 1883 to do that. And anyway, um, but then he did. He had he'd actually pra he practiced and 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 he'd done all his practical practical tests and everything. And he had finally been awarded his certificate, master's certificate. And in 1886. William Turner finally, uh, finally was 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 passed. He had actually passed his Border Trade Ship's Master certification, and he was certified as the Square Rig Master for foreign ships, for foreign going ships. But even though this had happened, he hadn't been given his command yet. So he spent three years after he left the Cunard. He'd spent three years, uh, you know. Traveling the globe and traveling the seas, and you know, and as I said, they'd been in eighteen eighty six. He'd been awarded 
uh, finally had been awarded the Board of Trade um, uh, Masters to, uh, exam and certified to uh, as a square rig master for foreign going ships in 1888. And William Turner had um, served his first mate under the captain of Captain Gardner. And he was a, a, on, and his ship was the Royal George. And then, when he was on, then he then he joined the what the, the Prince Frederick. Mm -hmm. And the Prince Frederick was under the command of Captain Wood. And then after that, he'd returned to the Cunard Line. But he had, it, but the thing is, when he joined back, he had outlined his intentions with Cunard. Because Cunard hadn't, you know, because he wanted big, he wanted his own command. So, but um, so he wanted to, so he wanted to go into the into the higher ranks. But he'd outlined his intentions, and the and the, the company actually promoted him to second in command. And and that was on the first of March eighteen eighty eight. And in in March eighteen eighty nine, he was given his first command. So the first command, which was which was it, it was it was given command of a vessel called the uh, the the Star of the East bound. Uh, the, sorry, the Star of the East, bound from New York to Australia. Obviously, that was. So I'm sure he was grateful for the Cunard to promote him like that, and obviously whatever. So obviously that that, you know, obviously the the intentions worked. When he came back to Cunard, but Captain William Turner had been given the nickname Bowler Bill. The reason why he was called Bowler Bill was because he had the what do they call it? He had built himself a, a, that that name because every time he was given a new command, he would buy a new bowler hat. <laughs> Every time he get it, it, that's it. When he, I, I, you know, but it's funny how these nicknames come around, like with Captain Bartlett, Charlie, you know, Iceberg Charlie. But he was called Bowler Bill because he would always buy a bowler hat every time he was given a new command. Oh, that is classic. I know. And in 1905, he was transferred over to the Invernia for the Boston service. Now the Invernia was. Carpathia's sister ship. Now, this is another ship that William Turner, Captain William Turner, would also have a rocky history with later on. But that's so he's been given the command of uh, of the Avernia, and he was the captain of the Avernia for two years. And then he had married a, a woman called Alice Elizabeth Hitching. But the marriage didn't last very long. The marriage became very rocky, and by eight, by 1903 they'd separated, and the marriage had broken down. They'd only they'd got two children, and they the his wife was living in the marital home in Manchester, with the two with her two boys. So that wasn't a great time in his life, and I believe, if I remember correctly, that. Um, him and him and his ex actual what is uh, him and his wife were actually cousins. Oh, first cousins. I don't know whether they were first cousins. I don't know if they were second, third, or what. But I know they were cousins. Right. If they were first cousins, then ill. <laughs> I know, but I suppose legally you can marry your cousins anyway. Uh, yeah, and then he during that time of. That you know the relationship breaking down. He'd met a woman called Mabel a a Every, who he would spend the rest of his life with. And I, and if I remember correctly as well, that um, he became estranged with his sons, as well. I don't think they had much of a relationship. Anyway, I believe that af I believe as well uh, after he'd retired from the Cunard line that he did go and try and build that relationship with his two children. Anyway, uh, in 1908, he was appointed captain of the Umbria, and uh, which only lasted around four months. It was only a very, it was a very short command. 
And then in November 1908, Captain James Watt had retired as Commodore of the Cunard Line. And basically what had happened was um, Captain John Pritchard, who was currently working on the Mauritania, had spoken out, well, it's not spoken out, but there was a there was a moment where um you know where there there was a bit of a rocky relationship with them two so with captain williams turner's record speaking volumes for him over his career you know his early career uh, with cunard captain james watt on uh, uh spoken to the board of uh, the board of the cunard and captain william turner was uh, had assumed command of the Lusitania on November the 11th of 1908. So under Captain William Turner's command, the Lusitania started beating her own record and she was capturing the Blue Ribbon. But the sister, Mauritania, claimed it back a few times. Yeah, and it would go on for 30 years, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now this is where the the relationship started getting a bit rocky with um Commodore Pritchard. Now in December 1909 Cap Commodore Pritchard had retired from the Cunard line and because of the new policy uh that that Cunard had taken on and it, they did, he didn't like the way uh, Captain William Turner was being treated differently, but they, but Cunard had um, had appointed, or at least um, appointed William Turner to succeed um, Commodore Commodore Pritchard as captain of the Mauritania, which at the time was being was on was in dry dock to have her annual um, an annual. Overdue, you know, overhaul. Uh, so Captain James T. Charles had replaced Captain William Turner as captain of the of, of the Lusitania when uh, Captain William Turner had uh, been appointed captain of the Mauritania. Now we know that Captain William Turner was in command of the Lusitania in 1910. When a rogue wave had struck the Lusitania's bridge, or well, it struck the Lusitania, and the Lusitania's bridge was pushed back a few feet, but she made it under her own steam back home to have repairs. Movement of the bridge was never repaired, was never altered. It stayed like that through the whole of the rest of Lusitania's career. Uh, after the rogue wave, um, obviously the Lusitania had to be repaired, and then. We know when the Titanic left um, Southampton on the uh, 10th of April, 1912, um, the Titanic, uh, sorry, the, the Captain William Turner was in command of Mauritania. And the Mauritania had left Liverpool at the exact same time as Titanic left for a maiden voyage from Southampton on a maiden, yeah, you know. <laughs> And the the Mauritania had actually docked at Cherbourg a couple of hours ahead of Titanic. And then she went on. Uh, I guess she also went on to Queenstown or something, you know. Uh, but that's, that's a, there's the Titanic connection. So when the uh, Titanic had sunk, we know that the um, Board of Trade findings was that um, that the Obviously, they needed more lifeboats and things like that. And, you know, uh, so Lusitania and both Lusitania and Mauritania were pulled in to have um, them sort, you know, to have add, to add more lifeboats to the, the ship. Um, but I, I believe that the Cunard line was not waiting to find out on the, you know, the actual inquiry into the sinking when they knew when they actually put more lifeboats onto their ships because they knew that the Titanic had, hadn't had enough lifeboats. So anyway, uh, so after that, we know that the war had broke out in 1914 and um, the Lusitania and Mauritania 
there was two reasons why they were built. And I've said this before in my last videos, but just to refresh people's minds is that Lusitania and Mauritania were built for two reasons. They were built for either auxiliary, auxiliary cruisers in the event of war or ocean liners. There was an agreement between Cunard and the British Admiralty uh, to borrow money, um, £2.6 million pounds to be exact, at an interest rate of 2.7%. And that would be paid over a 20, 20 year period. And But the agreement was uh, that if in the event of war, that the Lusitania and Mauritania could be used as, as auxiliary cruisers. But one of the things was that the, the Lusitania and Mauritania had to be constructed to Admiralty specification. It means they had to be built like battleships and with battleship steel, which was high tensile steel. Uh, but even before the war broke out, the Lusitania and Mauritania had gun mounts added to their decks just in case in the event of war, so that guns could be added to the decks of the Lusitania and Mauritania. So that's the brief history of the Lusitania and Mauritania. Now, when the war broke out, passenger service sort of slowed down. It, it was still going, but it had slowed down um, because obviously uh, the dangers of, you know, of the war. But the problem is with the Lusitania and Mauritania, they were so expensive to run because it was so fast. Um, unlike the, the, the Titanic and the Olympic in Britannic, they were built with uh, reciprocating engines as well as turbine engines. The Lusitania and Mauritania had been built only with turbine engines. So they were very fast ships and they could reach up to between 20 to 26 knots, which was very fast. This is why they would easily capture the Blue Ribbon. So when the war broke out, um, the Admiralty were not too sure on what they were going to do with passenger ships. And the problem is is um, the Mauritania would, would consume up to 1,000 tonnes a day, which was pretty expensive, especially when there's a war on and there's war, you know, shortages. <laughs> to say the least. And it's not just not just Lusitania Mauritania, same with the Britannic and all other large ships. Even I mean Britannic wasn't as fast as Lusitania Mauritania. She would consume up to maybe six hundred and fifty tons a day. Um but even then they were questioning what to do with because, you know, money was tight and they had to be careful what they were putting that what the Admiralty was putting their money into. So even Britannic was laid up for so many, uh, not just because um, the war was unsure what they were going to do with them, but also the White Star was in debt with Holland and Wolf, a lot of debt, <laughs> so they couldn't finish the Britannic off. And so the Admiralty had decided because because the Lusitania and Mauritania was so expensive, they only could afford to really keep one in service as auxiliary cruiser or troop ship, which was the Mauritania. The Mauritania was turned into a troop ship during the war. and um, But the Lusitania was kept in, um, in passenger service. But <laughs> that did not stop the Admiralty from using the Lusitania to carry munitions, but it happened, you know, whatever people think about it and whatever people think the Admiralty were up to, it happened, they were using ships, it, you know, even, even Carpathia, she was supposed to be kept in passenger service, but that didn't stop Cunard from trans or the Admiralty using uh, Carpathia to transport troops and things. So, you know, and she, also she was painted in camouflage at some point in a you know in a world career but she was kept in passenger service didn't stop companies from using them britannic was turned into a hospital ship the aquitania was turned into a hospital ship as well as troop ship um uh going between the dardanelles campaign in the mediterranean 
but the Lusitania was kept in passenger service. But one of the things that I read is that Lusitania may, and the Mauritania as well, may have been built with a secret compartment to hide munitions. The Lusitania um, had a very, not, I mean, there was nothing really serious that happened in the first part of the war. But we know that on the 1st of May, uh, 1915, the Lusitania departed New York for a seven-day trip. Um, now, because of the now because of the war shortages, I mean, Captain William Turner wasn't keen on having munitions on board. He wasn't happy about it. He made it quite clear he wasn't happy about it. But they did it anyway. Um, as they put it, you're opening the war effort. That's it. You know. Either leave it or lump it, you know. <laughs> they were they were they were not they were having none of his thingies, they were gonna do it anyway. So uh, so they carried munitions on board and um whatever I, I don't know what was on we, we know it was gun cartridges and things like that. Anyway, so she departed New York and uh now because of the war shortages, even Lusitania could not run to her full potential. Half of her boilers were not even lit. Um, I think three of her boiler rooms were not even functioning at the time. Uh, because of coal shortages, they couldn't afford to, to have a thousand tons a day being shoveled into a ship. So they they cheapened it by cutting half of a power. The voyage was event not eventful. It was it was okay, you know. There was nothing serious. I mean. Uh, there was a few people on board uh, where Captain William Turner would not entertain. Uh, captain William Turner was kind of a guy that didn't really, you know, he was the captain and that's it. His his charge was the ship. He wasn't like Captain Smith where he would go to dinner parties and, you know, you know what I mean? He wasn't that sort of person. Yeah. Um, and also would... they had a staff captain for that, didn't they? Exactly, yeah. So they, they, they gen... So what he would do is he would send one of his crew members if there was a party he was invited to. And one of these parties was um, a guy called um, Charles Roman, who was a theatrical producer. And Charles Roman didn't leave his cabin through the whole voyage. Uh, he, le he never left his cabin, and he would host parties in his cabin for pe people that he knew. And one of the people that he'd invite was Captain William Turner. But Captain William Turner was he wasn't he wasn't interested. I mean, it, it, not only that, it was a war it was wartime as well, so things were stricter anyway. Um, I mean, even the crew weren't allowed to know where they were going, um, because that was between the captain and the admiralty or whatever, or, you know, Junard. Um, because obviously you you don't know there might be spies on board, so you know it was kept on the quiet only him and the crew and every you know the quartermasters quartermasters were given directions they were not told where they were going and even the pad but i say it's the, it's the way it was it was strict but captain captain william turner didn't go to these parties and he would send one of his crew members the night before the incident the disaster itself um captain william turner had gone to uh warn passengers to keep lighters and things not on deck only in cabins you weren't allowed to have, have cigars or, or lit things on deck it was because they'd had warnings of submarines in the area and the problem is what captain captain william turner was quite frustrated because the the admiralty had sent a report well cunard cunard had sent a report to captain william turner that submarines were in the area but they didn't tell him where, when, on, on, and what time they were sighted, but but the night before he had gone to it, there was a there was a a, a part well not a party but a um a gala, no there was there was a talent show going on there was some singing and dancing and 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 uh, well not dancing but joke telling and juggling and all that sort of thing just to keep the morale up for the passengers. Uh, but Captain William Turner. Um, interrupted this for a few minutes where he told the, the passengers not to light cigars and keep their lights um, off 
at night time in their cabins and things like that because of submarines. The next day, they there was a bit of an issue because fog had taken hold in the morning and um, Captain William Turner had lost his, uh, lost his bearings. But this was not just a problem for Captain William Turner, but it was a problem for the U-boat, for U-boat 20 as well. So <laughs> anyway, at 12.40 p.m., the Lusitania was on a course of North 47 East and Captain William Turner had received a message that submarines, uh, submarines had been sighted five five miles off the Cape of Clear, west sighted at ten p.m. at uh, sorry ten a.m. But this message meant immediate danger, and anyway, <laughs> he didn't. I don't think he took this this message particularly seriously, because he he allowed himself to have a bit of a grin, a bit of a smile. So he knew that one of his officers were about to go off um, duty. I think it was Bicep, uh, one of the officers. And uh, he, he asked one of the, the crew members that was taking over his spot, um, do, do you know how to take a four-point course reading? Yes, sir. I do, sir. Anyway. So the... <laughs> When the fog had, had lifted, he had spotted the old head of King Sail, which was well known for sea mariners. Uh, it was as if the Lusitania had sighted a familiar spot, and and he knew, and a lot of mariners would use the old head of King Sail for bearings and things. They knew where they were when they when they saw that lighthouse. And it had been there for, you know what I mean? It was it's it served mariners in the past very well. So when he saw the old Edda King sail, now U U20 had sighted a ship around 14 miles off the starboard back off the starboard side. The, the uh, captain uh, C S, uh, well, I think it was his, uh, uh, Sky, Sky, uh, I can't remember, pronounce his name. But the captain of U twenty had sighted the the U uh, the, a ship through his binoculars, the commander, and he saw uh, smoke coming out of stacks. Now he knew that any ship with three or four funnels was a huge ship, was a big liner. And um, but still, she was she was too far off. The Lusitania was too far off, and she was uh, she was. Now, because of the fog, the the captain of uh, Captain William Turner had lowered the speed down to fifteen knots. But then, when the fog cleared, he had raised the ship up to around eighteen knots. Um, that was the reported speed. But even the speed is still debated to this day what Lusitania was actually doing. Anyway, um, so Captain William Turner. He knew that he weren't going to cap capture the, the U commander of U twenty. Just he didn't know. He, he he said we ain't going to catch it. You know she's not. She's too fast. She's too far off. They didn't. And she she was also running uh low on torpedoes. They only had three torpedoes left, and she was really running low on speed. But they wanted to keep those, um, uh, at least most of those uh torpedoes for the return voyage back to home in case they came across war warships that they'd have to. You know, take down. But Captain William Turner, when he when he spotted Old Eddie Kingsale, he had changed the ship's course to from uh, to from north to south south eighty seven east, which then brought the Lusitania in direct contact with U twenty. So then U twenty submerged, and she'd set a G type torpedo up to strike the Lusitania. She was going to hit the Lusitania. But the, the U-20 had actually broken laws because there was what they call the cruiser rule. Now, what U-20 should have done is fired a warning shot to allow passengers to get off the Lusitania before the Lusit Lusitania is uh, attacked. But the U-20 didn't do this. And he set his torpedo, and the torpedo was fired around 2.10 p.m. Anyway, 
So then the Lusitania was str- as soon as soon as they knew the torpedo was coming at them because they sighted it. They sighted the 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 torpedo wash, and Captain William Turner immediately came to the starboard wing, and he said, "Harder starboard, you know, we're going to be the ship. The ship is going to be attacked." They tried to evade, but unfortunately, the torpedo was just too quick, was too close, and it struck the starboard side of the Lusitania. And a huge roar of explo- it, it just it was just cha- chaos. Um, then se- seconds after the, the Lusitania had a second explosion, which then straight away after that torpedo uh, after the second explosion, there was an immediate loss of steam pressure. And uh, basically, the Lusitania was a runaway ship at this point. There's no way she was gonna. Um, be able to steer or whatever, you know. It, she was in a bad way, and within the first few minutes, she took a very heavy list to starboard. Just hell was breaking loose, and and also one of the uh, the um, assistant um, the assistant captain James Anderson, who was who was also thinking it was was hadn't taken the incident very seriously. He didn't think the ship would sink, and which then may have delayed in the launching of the port lifeboats because he he thought the ship was going to stay afloat, that, you know, that she wasn't that damaged. Uh, so he was blamed for his lack of action in the, inc- you know, in the situation because um, he just did not believe the Lusitania was going to sink. Not long after the torpedo struck, the Lusitania lost power, and that that means you, you know <laughs> everything's gone out. You know, also some of the portholes um, had been left open on the lower decks. But the problem is with the Lusitania is with her long with her bulkhead design, the longitude and the transverse bulkheads. The problem is with that is. They were also used for coal storage. There was, you know, as coal bunkers as well. And the problem is, you, the problems they had is, when it, if the Lusitania took a list on, you couldn't trim the ship. You couldn't transfer that water to any other part of the vessel. So, you know, and also, when you had to, when you closed the watertight doors, you had to make sure they were closed because there was, you'd have coal in the way of the doors bit of a rubbish design really to be fair and straight away the Lusitania really started to sink Captain William Turner tried his best you know um, the lifeboats on the port side became completely useless um, were sliding off the decks and crushing people and really causing problems Captain William Turner knew Pretty much straight away, there was he was in trouble. The ship was in serious trouble. The captain uh, decided to uh, try and steer the ship towards uh, the you know island to try and beach the ship to try and shallow the vessel, but the ship was just sinking too quickly, and uh, st- it became apparent straight away that she's going to go down, but not to the assistant the captain apparently. But there you go. Anyway. Uh, there was screams, there was shouting, there was a night. It was just a complete, it was like hell had broke loose that afternoon. Anyway, captain, the captain of the command, the commander of U-20 was watching the vessel sink. And he could just couldn't believe that one torpedo could cause so much damage. I think U-20, the, it, now the Lusitania had been warned, any vessel that was flying the British flag, was warned before the, even the Lusitania departed. The German embassy had put in in the New York Times that if you sail on a ship that's flying the British the, the British flag, you you're going to be attacked because you're, you're in in the war zone at least. But uh, I think what U twenty was going to be doing. I think what the original plan was that he didn't think he'd sink the ship with one torpedo. That he'd think that he thought that the that one torpedo wouldn't be able to take that, you know, that ship down. And I think it kind of surprised him, 
you know, that this, that one torpedo could do so much damage. U-20, the U-20 commander also um, spotted the second explosion. He said there was a second explosion, like a ball of flames coming from the holds of the ship. And um, anyway, the passengers on board, I mean, oh, I mean, poor, I mean, for instance, poor um, Charles Froman, I mean, he had an injured leg. Well, he had ligaments in his leg from a uh, fall that had happened a couple of years back. Uh, that he he knew we weren't going to get off alive. I mean, he went down with the ship. But Captain William Turner, um, you know, sent down his crew to go and find out the damage, what was really going off with the Lusitania. Because unlike, you know, Captain Smith, who had the designer on board, Captain William Turner didn't. So, you know, he was only able to get a, a sense of what was really going on with the Lusitania by crew members coming back and reporting the flooding and the damage. Um, there'd been this force of water into the ship's hull and she was just going so fast. And Captain William Turner got to the point where he abandoned, he, he gave the ship to, a, you know, to abandon ship and everything. Only six of the 48 lifeboats on board Lusitania were successfully launched. And uh, Captain William Turner came on, went onto the bridge, tightened his cap, and he was ready to go down with the ship. But somehow he ended up on the port side of the bridge, and um, the bridge wing, shall I say, and it swept him off the ship, and he swam to a, a an overturned, um, well, not an overturned, but a, a deck chair. Now he was under the impression that. The ship had been abandoned. But then he looked back and saw all these passengers screaming, shouting, basically fighting for their lives as the Lusitania was taking them down with her. And one of the things that he remembers seeing was when the funnels started to go in, because the funnels were still attached to the ship, they never fell off the ship as the ship sank. And realistically, they were probably one of the last things to be filled with water when everything else was. And as they submerged, they were sucking people into the funnels and spitting them back out again. And that's what he remembers the most. That's what stuck with him, was seeing his, his, his passengers being sucked into the Lusitania's funnels and then being spat out again. I mean, the guilt that he must have felt. The guilt. And... Uh, Anyway, the Lusitania sank within 18 minutes and took with her 1,198 people with her. And they didn't, none, of them, none of them survived. Neither did the assistant captain. The assistant captain didn't survive. So after the sinking, um, Captain William Turner was pulled from the sea uh, unconscious and uh, he was taken to Ireland, to Queenstown, where he saw all these bodies lined up on the on the dock. It must have killed him. Anyway, it must have destroyed him emotionally. Anyway, uh after the, the Lusitania sinking, there was an inquiry. Um Cunard wanted to blame Captain William Turner. The Admiralty wanted to blame him for the sinking. And Lord Mersey, who had been in charge of the Titanic inquiry, was now in charge of the Lusitania inquiry. And one of the things that Mersey wanted to do was not make the mistakes he made in the Titanic inquiry. He wanted a, a better inquiry when it came to Lusitania. Now, one of the reasons why um, Cunard wanted to blame um, William Turner was realistically was to take the blame off themselves because uh, there was supposed to have been a, a transport transport ship to go out to the Lusitania and bring her into into Liverpool. But that never happened. And it's because Cunard didn't want to send out any of their ships. They wanted to keep them in dock because, you know, they just couldn't spare any ship, apparently. You know? Um, so that never happened. So I suppose they wanted to take the blame off themselves, you know, and, and blame the captain. But also, one of the reasons why they wanted to blame with because he had received wireless messages about 
um, particularly about submarines and submarines in the area. He was also at fault because he hadn't zigzagged. He hadn't zigzagged the ship, and he also brought his ship close to the coast, which is something you don't generally do because U-boats do tend to um, patrol the coast, especially Ireland. And he had done, and that's when his ship was struck. But Lord Mersey felt that Captain William Turner was a competent captain. He did everything that he could in within his power as captain, and they, he cleared him of all blame of the sinking. But that still didn't put Turner in, in um, favour with um, the public and, and also... Uh, with Cunard. But anyway, uh, so that happened. After the Lusitania sinking and after the inquiry was cleared, um, he was given another command, um, and it was the Avernia, which he'd been in command of her in 1905. And this was on, this was about two years, just under two years after the Lusitania sinking. And it was on the 1st of January, 1917, when uh, the Avernia the sister ship to the Carpathia was running as a troop ship. And her job was to go from England to the Dardanelles campaign, which was in the Mediterranean. And the um, Ivernia was torpedoed by a submarine and um, Captain William Turner was in charge of the ship. He was in command of the ship. And again, just like on the Lusitania, he was... On the bridge, he never abandoned, he never left the ship the whole time. He made sure, tried to make sure everything was getting, but the loot, the Averna sank so quickly, unbelievably quick by the bow. He was swept from the bridge of the ship as it sank beneath him. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, again. And 87 of the troops that were on board went down with the vessel, didn't survive. Anyway. Um, after that sinking, Captain Willington was never given a command ever again, ever again in his whole. That's it. While he was with Cunard, he, they gave him a desk job and they put him under a desk. He will never sail another ship of theirs ever again. In 1919, uh, Captain William Turner was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, anyway, he, he he had to retire. He had to retire from from. The, the you know from sea life he, he never sailed ever again i don't think he ever saw the sea ever again after that uh but he did live for a good uh 10 years or so after that and he retired to um i think an apartment where he was living with his mistress shall i say his lady who he had met before mabel every they never married um but there was something romantic going off between them. I think he he said that he she was his housekeeper, but there was something going on between them romantically. Ding ding ding. <laughs> yeah, and uh, sadly, um, Captain William Turner passed away in June nineteen thirty three, and that was the end of the captain. Of William Turner. It's sad because he went from such a um, decorated captain, silver medals, medals from Cunard, saving lives where, you know, selfless acts, where he didn't have to, but he did, to being completely disgraced by Cunard and the Admiralty for the Lusitania sinking. And then surviving another shipwreck, and Cunard not giving him another ship ever again. So he went from a complete decorated captain to someone that practically lost everything that he'd built from the ground up, and then he 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 passes away. And it, it seems that he had a rocky life as well, especially his married married life with his wife. You know, their relationship didn't last. Um, yeah, it's 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 unbelievable, isn't it? How mm. can how can someone go from such heights to such lows because of one 
moment in his ta- in, in his career where he had no control because it was the perils of war you know um it's sad really is sad i mean there's so much more that you can say about uh, Captain William Turner, but I know that in the other videos I refer to him a lot, and especially yeah. with the Lusitania, but I think this says it all really, and I don't think there's a lot of detail we can go into, but we've just got to appreciate for who he really is, and he, I think I think of him as more sympathetic now than I did um, before. I think, I, I think a lot of people, I mean, People really give William Turner a hard time. It's a bit like history has gave Ismay a hard time for surviving Titanic. And we have to remember is that what has happened has happened, you know? Uh, would we have done anything different? We probably would now, knowing what we know. But they didn't know back then. I mean, Captain William Turner didn't know U-Boat 20 was round. Oh, he knew submarines were around in the area, but what the Admiralty and, and Cunard, um, they said that they were, she was patrolling the area, but captains work on navigation. Where did you see it? Where in the area did you see it? Where, what position? They didn't give him that. They just said that there was submarines in the area. So what was he supposed to do? He didn't know bringing his ship closer to the coast, 80, um, south, south uh, 87 east, towards Ireland. He didn't know U-Boat 20 was there. U-Boat 20 could have been way back, could have been way forward. He didn't know. He didn't know a torpedo was coming at him until the very last moment when he, he couldn't do anything because the, Lus the U-Boat 20 was so close to the Lusitania when she, when she hit the Lusit when she... Um, struck the lucid hit well when when she fired the torpedo that they could actually literally read the name lusitania in gold letters on the ship that's how close they were you know it, 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 you, i mean captain william turney only had seconds to react seconds to react he didn't have minutes he had seconds you know um it's a bit like titanic had 30 had only had 30 seconds before she, from the sight of the iceberg to when she hit the iceberg. You know what I mean? Like, they had seconds to think. They've got to get a 46, well, 47,000 tonne worth of ship out of the way of an iceberg, out of the way of a hazard, in, you know, in front of them. Just like Captain William Turney had, had seconds to think of getting a 30-something tonne ship out of the way of a torpedo. It ain't going to happen. Mm. It ain't going to happen. That's it. I mean, I think since we're running out of time on Zoom, we're going to have to wrap it up because yeah. I know there's so much more we can go into, but I definitely think there's a lot of things that said at all. So I'm sorry to keep this short, no, Jake, no but worries, I know but... Zoom, it's a pain. <laughs> but it thank is, you so but... much for yeah, coming thank on today. You. Thank you. Yeah. I just, well... wanted to put, I just wanted to make sure that William Turner was, in a way, put in a better light than he has done You know, in the past. History has not been fair to him. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good thing to wrap up. And until then, everybody, I will see you again soon. And Jake, thank, thank you, you so much once again. Take care, mm -hmm. everyone. Bye. You. Bye, now. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.